Welcome to Park Media. We are back. I'm your host, Vince Emanuele, and we are joined by a regular guest of the program. He's been here a couple times before. Uh, you can obviously find his work at ZNet, uh, Z Communications, and that's Michael Albert. And today, we are going to be talking about his book, uh, him and Robin Hannell's book that they wrote years ago and a concept that they came up with called Participatory Economics. And we're going to do sort of a deep dive into that. Mike, thanks for joining us again. Thank you for having me. So let's start very simply. Uh, 50 years ago, you proposed an alternative to capitalism. You called it participatory economics. So to start, what caused you two to develop this vision, or a model, I guess we could call it, and why did you put so much time into it in the years after? Well, the first part is, in those days, a uh, long time ago, uh, when we moved left, various people, I guess, of my generation, we tended to move into a kind of a Marxist and socialist perspective of one sort or another. And um, Robin and I both found that in that perspective, we weren't very satisfied with the answers that were given to basically the question, what do you want? Um, what is this thing that you're seeking? Uh, called socialism. And that wasn't enough, perhaps, to propel it. But what did was the number of people who, when you would be organizing and when you would um, be talking with folks, would actually want to know, what are you for? Uh, what's the positive aim here? I get, says the person, that you're against all these various things. After all, you scream it every two minutes. But <laughs> what are you for? And um, we felt that we needed to be able to answer that question better than we were able to answer it. And so we set out on, on the path that I guess we took. What year another was that, factor, Mike? Honestly, another factor was I was at, in Cambridge and so was Robin and uh, so was Chomsky, Noam. And, uh, you know, his work was anarchistic but also uh, oriented in those days toward trying to answer that question or at least uh, legitimating the importance of it and that probably had a fact a, an effect on us as well yeah because he's been chomsky's been a pretty strident critic against leninism he's been a big critic against uh you know some of the sectarian socialist groups that have been out there what year was this mike well when robin and i first started working on participatory economics, I would say it was probably, you know, in the early 70s. But we had been interacting together, uh, you know, from when we got leftist, I suppose you could say, which would be 65, 66, 67 in there. Um, and so we were talking about stuff that, that emerged into it. Um, starting earlier. Were you engaging with the uh, Marxist economists and theorists oh, yeah. at the time? Sure, all the time. It, it, again, in those days, um, that was the, the path on the campus into radicalism. You, uh, you might have gone uh, into it via civil rights off campus um, and later on via the women's movement uh, pretty much anywhere. Uh, but when I became political and when Robin did and when we became very, very active, uh, 67, 68, I think it's fair to say that you, you couldn't do that without uh, coming into contact with various brands of Marxist and Leninist and all the rest of it, uh, none of which uh, did much for us, to be honest. Um, even early on, we found that of course, Marxism had lots of very, very intelligent things to say, but it didn't seem to us that it was uh, suited to and sufficient for a, a modern movement, a movement in, the, in that period and from then till now, for that matter. Did some of that have to do with developments on the ground? In other words, what was unfolding in the Soviet Union and various other socialist experiments? Um. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if you're asking by changes there. It had a lot to do with what went on in all those yeah. uh, endeavors. Yeah. That's what I mean, uh, yeah. So for instance, Robin and I wrote a book called uh, Socialism Today and Tomorrow, and another one called, uh, uh, what was the name of it? Something about 
first one was unorthodox Marxism, and then there was a another one that was paired with the socialism today and tomorrow, and I can't even remember the name of it. But you can see, having written a book called Marx, Unorthodox Marxism, and then another one on Marxism, and then one on socialism, and I had earlier written a book called What is to be Undone, a play on Lenin's title. Obviously, we were uh, very much um, reacting to uh, those schools. Yeah. And, uh, but it wasn't so much phenomena that were going on at the moment inside the Soviet Union as it was the history of, say, the Soviet Union or China or Cuba and all the rest of it. Right. How did we, I'm going to, we're going to dive right into more of the details about the actual vision. But the last question I have on sort of the political landscape when this came about was, were there other people at the time who were trying to develop maybe alternatives, perhaps not as detailed, maybe not, I shouldn't say as detailed, perhaps not as thought out as, as yours and Robin's work? Um, sort of outside of the Marxist I I, Yeah, I, I don't really feel overly confident saying no. Um, there weren't very many, but I don't think there were. Um, uh, there was something similar to what has existed ever since for a lot of, of people, which was uh, a formulation that w rested on values. Uh, you know, we want freedom, we want liberty, we want people to be able to control their own lives, we want people to not, and, and on and on. Uh, but there wasn't that much that was, uh, that addressed, um, <laughs> My glasses seem crooked and it's distracting the hell out of me. Um, uh, but there wasn't that much that it, that went into institutions, except for those who were um, supportive of what they called socialism in the Soviet Union, uh, basically, or in China, um, later in Cuba. Um, there were people who supported those models and therefore they were putting forth a, a vision, I suppose you could say, but we just didn't accept it. We didn't think it was, uh, it was very attractive to be honest. Um, and we were quite sure it wasn't attracting, um, very many except, uh, you know, a relatively small circle of people who became adherents of those views. Sure. All right, let's dive straight into it. So what is at the heart of the participatory economic vision? What do you think are its sort of central, central, I'm sorry, or essential aspects? It's not that much, honestly. Um, that is to say, we never thought that the goal or the task was to describe every little um, feature or even every big feature of a new economy. Um, an economy is something... Um, at its core, it has only a few basic and critical institutions. And that's true for capitalism, and it's also true for participatory economics. So capitalism is very different in uh, in Sweden and in uh, the old South Africa and in the United States and so on, because there are lots of things on top of those basic core features. And the same thing would be true, I think, of participatory economics. There would be different instances of it that varied one from another because of those secondary features and because of the history of the country and because of um, various factors like that. But at the core of participatory economics, just like at the core of capitalism or feudalism, I think there are features that define it. And um, in so far as at least the way we've conceived it, the features would be uh, that there are self-managing uh, workers and consumers councils. There is uh, balanced job complexes for the division of labor. That's what we called it. There's remuneration or income for how long you work, how hard you work, and the intensity of, of uh, or how long, how hard, which is intensity, and the onerousness of the work that you do. And then there would be a, there has to be an allocation system. And in the case of participatory economics, that was called participatory planning. So each of those things um, needs to be spelled out in order to have something that's a vision. But I think an economic vision that's justifiable um, would have those four things and it would go beyond that only hypothetically, um, because beyond that is for the future to pick, so the, uh, to, to develop and to choose. 
So the way Robin and I thought of it was roughly that the task was to find a set of, of underlying defining institutions which would allow the population, meaning workers and consumers, um, to control their own lives, to do all the things that, that socialists talk about being in favor of, to have classlessness, to have equity, um, to be able to um, uh, you know, express themselves and so on. But the, the trick was to define institutions that facilitate that as compared to those that we're familiar with and we live under and those which have characterized what's called 20th century socialism, or I like to call it coordinatorism, which are contrary to those goals. Um, so it's really just uh, those four institutions, I would say. Okay, let's start with uh, councils and self-management. Why do you think being for councils and self-management uh, in a future economy, why does it matter now and what does it matter for where we go from here? Okay. Um, well, first of all, that isn't particularly new. I don't want to make any pretense here that sure. Robin and I somehow came up with the notion of a, of a council. Um, we didn't. Uh, they have been prevalent throughout history for a very obvious reason. If workers are going to manifest their preferences, if workers are going to arrive at opinions and desires and then are going to manifest that in the working of the economy, well, where are they going to do that? Um, so this isn't very complicated. They're going to do it in their workplaces, and that means they have to have some sort of organization in their workplaces, and that's called a workers' council. And to the extent that consumers also are going to express themselves, especially collectively about collective consumption, well, the same idea. A, how you, where are you going to do that? Well, it's almost a truism. You can only do it in interaction with consumers, and you that that group of consumers or group of workers we call a council. The self-managing part of it, I suppose we did maybe add a little bit, not very much, but a little bit, um, because we were a little more precise about what self-management um, means, at least in our, in our view. For us, it means that a person should be able to control decisions uh, roughly in proportion to the degree they're affected by them. I should have a say in the stuff that affects me. And the level of my say, the, the extent of my say, should match the extent to which I'm affected. And that can be true for everybody. That's a norm that can apply to everybody um, uh, equally. It's, it, it's not different for some than others. Uh, obviously, a dictator has more say in decisions than somebody who's subject of the dictator. But if they all, if everybody has a say in decisions in proportion to the degree that they're affected by them, then everybody is relating similarly to decisions. So self-managing councils um, is the vehicle for workers and consumers to uh, interact with other workers and consumers, develop their preferences, and then express them in the economy. Why is it of consequence now to say that in a good new economy, we would want to have workers and consumers self-managing councils. Well, one reason is because it does sort of open the prospect or the idea of uh, organization in workplaces and organization in communities, which doesn't only uh, make a demand on behalf of the people in the workplace or in the community, say for higher wages or for, um, you know, less pollution and, uh, a new collective consumption good, a pool for the neighborhood or whatever. Uh, it also uh, augurs a way to, or, or it shows a way to organize there, which is organizing an institution. Uh, it's organizing something lasting. Uh, so it's not a union in the workplace, though a union's a good thing. It's a workers' council. It's workers in the workplace organizing together to have lasting connections to one another and it's a place where they manifest their, their desires and they develop their um, preferences. And the same thing for a consumer unit. And then the idea of self-management adds something because it, well, that is a big deal. Um, you know, if you're in favor of self-management, if you're in favor of people having a say in decisions to the extent that they're affected by them, well, that, that just is completely different. It couldn't be more different uh, from what we have. Um, in any of the spheres of life, and certainly in the economy, since in the economy, what we have is basically inside each workplace a dictatorship, where the owner and the owner's um, 
agents in the workplace, what I call a coordinator class, um, make the decisions and the workers basically carry them out. Um, and that has nothing to do with self-management, obviously. Now, you mentioned that co- the concept of councils isn't a new thing. So in the past, when they've been tried, what would be sort of sort of the things you would mention um, that made them fail? What would you note uh, that maybe they didn't work out well? Yeah. Um, and also well, the scale of them. In other words, in a small scale, it seems very doable. I'm assuming people will probably be watching this or listening saying, okay, I can imagine doing this in my town or maybe even in this part of my neighborhood. Now, how do we scale this up to like, you know, a national level? Well, you don't in some sense. That is to say a workers' council is a council in a workplace. And then you can have a federation of those into an industry council. But the whole economy is not a council. It's it's a, you know, a, a federation of of uh, councils inside industries, and then it's a set of industries. And when we get to the other institutions, we'll see how, what that might look like. And the same thing is true for uh, neighborhoods. A council isn't a 10 million person entity, it's a neighborhood council. Um, then you can have federations of those. But as far as in history, um, well, I think the, you know, you can spend forever on this, but I think the most um, graphic instance is arguably still what were called Soviets in the Soviet Union. Um, And the reason they failed is because they were destroyed uh, by uh, the Bolshevik movement um, and Leninism. Now that's a long discussion and obviously there are some people who would deny it. They would say that um, the Bolshevik movement supported the council or the Soviets and uh, strengthened them and so on. Uh, But I don't I don't agree with that. And uh, uh, there are other instances where you see such things happening, including in the present day. So, you know, in, in, in uh, when there were uh, upheavals in Argentina because the economy was in trouble, um, workers formed councils uh, in workplaces. And uh, in many instances, they took over the workplaces. Um, in Venezuela, there were councils formed in workplaces, and this still exists. Um, uh, and there are in communities as well, um, consumer councils. And now there's something called uh, uh, what's the? Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact label, but it's basically a network of consumer councils that form a a, a community organization that that goes citywide. Um, and so these are important experiments, uh, and that's what would happen, I think, uh, in any modern circumstance. If if workers rose up, they would tend to form uh, councils spontaneously. There's nothing; it it happens naturally because they have to talk to each other and they have to interact together. And the same thing, ultimately, if there's community organizing, it's the least difficult to to create and to envision and to argue for of the features of participatory economics, I think. Now, I'm sure other people have asked you this, and it's probably a simple question, but who and how would we determine how individuals are impacted by those decisions? Well, but that I mean, now you're jumping ahead to all of the other institutions. Okay. It's a perfectly fair question, as are all sorts of other ones that can be raised as we go along. But there's a there's a problem. You can't you, you and it's it's also a problem in thinking about it um, or in envisioning it in the, it in the first place. So for that matter, in envisioning uh, you know a vision for how to do kinship or how to do cultural relations or how to do political relations, you can't ask the initial fledgling or first institution to solve all the issues, right? It's that doesn't that doesn't follow. What what emerges as you go along is a set of institutions which interactively address all the issues. So at this point, I wouldn't, if I was just thinking about this and I sort of gravitated toward councils, and then I started thinking about, well, can the councils can councils determine how much stuff gets produced? Can councils determine how much income everybody gets? And I throw my hands up and I say, well, no, and therefore forget it, right? That's a natural, 
that's that's a path that a lot of people take when they think about vision they they try and ask too much too early of what they're putting together um you you have to sort of solve things progressively as you go through now when you get to the end you should you should be able to answer such questions for sure um as to how i mean the the quick answer and it may feel that way is that if you have a workers council so suppose you have a workplace that's producing i don't know violins or cars whatever it's producing and you have a certain number of workers there maybe it's 50 maybe it's a thousand um the answer is going to be that the workers council is the deliberative body it is the executive body of the workplace so the answer is going to have to be it just has to be um, that the workers are going to have to make that decision, that the workers are going to have to be able to um, assess the situation. Um, but now how they do that is going to have a lot to do with and be impacted by, well, what's determining income remuneration for the, for the workers in the workplace and how are the, the more most fundamental decisions being made, how much to produce, um, what, techniques to use and so on. Um, how is that being done? The, the hard version of your question would be to ask, wait a minute, Mike, um, you've got a workers council and the workers council, one of the things that has to happen in the workplace is they have to decide how many violins to make or how many cars to make. But the number of cars that are made is going to affect people all over the country. And the number of violins that are made are going to it's going to affect all the people who want to play violin. And in some sense, it might affect everybody because you're using some stuff to make violins. Sure. So how the hell are the workers in the workplace going to make a decision in a self-managing way without violating everybody else's self-management? Mm -hmm. Right. That's the problem that arises quickly. Mm -hmm. it, it, it appears how, if, if the workers are making all the decisions, then the consumers aren't having enough say in decisions that affect them. If the workers are making all the decisions, the people who would breathe the pollution from the workplace wouldn't have enough say in the decisions that are affecting them. So we're not done when we have workers and consumers councils. We're really just beginning. Sure. And there's overlap. I mean, you, the workers are also going to be consuming goods. They're yeah. going to be living in these neighborhoods. Yeah. Or it's actually a funny, a strange criticism that was made early on, not this early, you know, when, when the model existed or when the vision existed, was that some people would say, well, wait a minute, a worker is a worker and Joe the worker might be Joe the consumer, but what about Tom the consumer who doesn't work? Is it fair that any of the decisions are made in workers' council since Tom doesn't work? right? Tom might be too young or too old or too sick or whatever it is. Right? Sure. And so the person would say, no, it's not fair. The people who work in workplaces are getting to vote twice. And the people who work, who just live in communities, but aren't working are only getting one, one mechanism, the consumer council, not both. And so it's not, it's not democratic. It's not participatory junket. Um, I, I was, it, it's an incredulous kind of argument because the point of self-management is you have a say in the decisions that affect you in proportion to the degree they affect you. Well, that means consumers have to be, you know, very active in, in, in addressing their consumer situation and workers have to be that, and they both have to have an impact on the other, but it doesn't mean that because I don't work and you do, I should all of a sudden have the same say in your workplace that you have. I shouldn't because I'm, I'm not affected by it as much as you are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you have a say in the workplace that you work in. Yeah. Anyway, that's no, it a makes sense. Bar, but it brought, brought it to mind and it wasn't a big criticism and it didn't last very long. <laughs> so what about equitable remuneration? What is it and how was it? Uh, you know, how did that change or what is this, how is this different than say a Marxist vision? Well, first, or even the capitalist economy, system that exists now, yeah, any, any economist would tend to say that um, there are only a few ways to think about remuneration. Um, remuneration means the amount you get. Think about society as producing a big pie, right? The social product. 
So it's a, it's a whole lot of stuff. It, obviously, it's just hundreds of thousands of items of different kinds of items and in different quantities. So it's a gigantic pile. For the sake of discussion, call it a big pie. The question is, how big of a slice do you get? Right? What's your income? What's your claim on the social product? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about remuneration or income. Doesn't matter what economy we're thinking about, that's the issue that we're considering. And what economists uh, would say is that, and, and what anybody just thinking about it would say is that there are a few, a few patterns for how you remunerate. One is you remunerate for property. So if I own some property and the property um, contributes to the pie, the, 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 my ownership of the property leads to output that goes into the pie, I should get back in proportion to that. And that's, that's roughly the idea of profits, not exactly, but it's basically the idea of profits that you should get back for what you own. For the for the output that you, what you own contributes, um, and so you know somebody like I don't know uh, what's that Bezos owns the equivalent of God only knows how much, um, and and that's one norm, and every socialist opposes that norm. So I do too, uh, and so does every socialist who has ever. Um, been socialist until people started calling them socialist themselves socialists when they were really social democratic, which is now a big trend. Um, so in other words, you could conceivably um, favor people earning profits, at least to a certain level, uh, and call yourself a socialist nowadays, as quite a few do. But in the in the history of the term, Socialism has meant no profits, no private ownership. That's gone. Uh, so the second um, way of, of remunerating is that you basically get what you can take. Um, and that might sound strange because it's, it, you know, it, if, you, if you think about it, it's rather gross. It's basically saying it's a thug's economy. The more you can take, the more you get. Now, the reality is that that's what we have. Um, in markets, it's bargaining power, um, by and large, uh, as well as property, if you're a capitalist market system, that determines income, determines remuneration. So you get what you can take. So that's why, uh, you know, Al Capone said, I love the America, I love the US economy. It's because in the US, you get what you can take. And he was right. Um, and, and as a thug, he was uh, correctly identifying that that's a thought, a thought of a thug's um, uh, norm for what you should get. It means you're going to get less if in the country you're in some sort of uh, group. Um, maybe uh, it's an ethnic group or a racial group. Um, maybe it's gender. And that group is subordinate um, due to other dynamics. You'll get less from the economy too because you have less bargaining power. It means you'll get a little more if you have a union, which gives you some more bargaining power. It means you'll get more if you have property. And, and in reality, I think it's fair to say that what property, if, if you legalize profits, um, you can say that it's just because of property. But if you don't, it's because of the power that's afforded uh, to people by virtue of, of their property. All right, so that's ownership of private property is one possible remunerative norm. Um, you get what you can take is another. And the next one, uh, and socialists disavow both of those, as do I. The next one, um, many, many socialists advocate. And the next one is that you get back from the social product in proportion to what you contribute to it by your labors. So if you produce more of, the, of what's valued by society, more valuable output, some total of, of your output is more valuable, you get more back proportionately. So um, that means, well, you didn't, I guess you did ask me which one, you know, to, to say what I liked. So I have to say what I don't like about that. It seems right, which is why a lot of socialists advocate it. It seems right because 
if I put in more to the social product and I don't get it, somebody else is getting what I put in there. That doesn't seem right. And if I put in less, but I get more, well, then I'm getting something that somebody else put in there. And that doesn't seem right. And so you sort of gravitate, gravitate to this position that you get rid of profits and you know income for property and you get rid of basically stealing it, grabbing it, and you're left with the idea that you should get back in proportion to what you put in. But neither Robin nor I liked that at all, um, even just almost immediately upon thinking about it. And the reason was, relatively straightforward. We used to say in those days something toward about capitalists that, you know, they, they're they born um, uh, circling third base, headed for home, like in baseball, for home run, uh, and they're born already running down toward home plate, and the catcher, um, you know, is uh, doesn't have a glove to feel the ball that's coming to him, and not only that, um, he's taking time off to have a tea. So you're going to score. And a working person, a working class person is instead born to bat. And they're batting against, I think at the time we used to say Roger Clemens, he was a big pitcher at the time. But in any case, a great pitcher, and you're hitting not with a normal bat, but with a wiffle ball bat. And there's an extra five fielders out there. So in other words, there's this real asymmetry and it isn't that you know the the capitalist is is earning all this extra wealth by their effort or by what they're doing. It's just by virtue of birth, um, or by virtue of having somehow gotten a hold of the property. Well, what we thought is that it's very similar when you start to think about it. Um, if if you are born with um, Noam's brain, or uh, Michael Jordan's um, um, athleticism or, um, you know, Frank Sinatra's voice, why should you earn more? Why does luck in the genetic lottery, and that's what it is, right? You didn't do anything to get those things. You were just born with them. It's just luck. So why should luck in the genetic lottery entitle you to more income year after year after year? What possible moral reason is there for that? And after we decided that there was none, um, we then began to think, well, wait a minute. What if you're lucky and um, you're physically stronger? Again, no reason why you should get more. You're going to produce more, right? These, these basic genetic attributes might enable you to produce to contribute more to the social product. But that doesn't mean you should get more back, or at least it didn't to us. These are values. Not, it's not true or false. It's what you like and what you don't like. Mm -hmm. And we didn't like it. And then we began to think, well, what if you happen to work with better equipment? You know, what if you and I are, are each doing some kind of, I don't know, agricultural work, and you've got a tractor and I've got a shovel? Um, you're going to contribute more to the social product. But does that mean you should get more back? What if I'm working just as hard as you in the same conditions as you? Why should you get more because you were lucky enough to, to have this extra equipment? Uh, or for that matter, even if you, if, why should you get more if you are working with other people who are additionally capable and therefore they, they contribute to your... So we decided um, as to what comes out of that, what the positive result of that is, we, we decided that it, to us, it made sense that somebody should get more because they work longer or because they work harder or because they work under worse conditions. And that's it. Uh, they shouldn't get more based on their output, except that the output that they generate has to be socially valued. So I can't stand in my backyard, dig holes, fill them in while, you know, my kid shoots a hose at me so it's bad conditions and I earn a fortune because I'm working really hard, really long, and under worse conditions. Mm -hmm. But I'm not producing anything of value. So it's how long, how hard, and the onerousness of conditions under which you work doing socially valued labor. And uh, In the hope that the councils would be, the councils, both consumer councils and worker councils, would be developing an idea about what is valuable. 
Well, that that's going to have to be another institution, yes. And what is valuable isn't something that's written in stone. Right. We know this. It isn't something that's written in stone. It's a function of what people want, sure. right? Uh, something being valuable means that it is desired, socially desired. Now, how about, let me ask you this. How about somebody who's listening and they're saying, I don't mind if someone works, if they want to work harder to get more, I don't mind that. But I, but, right. but I don't want to be left to the wayside. Is that like the basic socialist? What does left to the wayside mean? Like you know. can't have health care, you don't have a house. Like in other words, if you have your material needs taken care of, you might have people who would say, well, if Sergio wants to go work more and get more than I do, even though he might not work harder, let him, I don't care, as long as I'm not starving or homeless or without health care. No, I, I don't think that's a common, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying now. One, one possibility of what you're saying might be, um, uh, I don't care if somebody else gets more, um, as long as I'm doing okay. Yeah. I don't think that follows. Uh, and I don't think it's true and I don't think it's right either. That is to say, uh, let me think. Okay. Suppose, suppose a thousand people are shipwrecked on an Island and you're about to create a, uh, you're not getting off. It's not happening anytime soon. So you have to survive. So after a few days, you realize, all right, we got to do something. Um, so you start to figure out how you're going to operate on the island, right? Now, we haven't talked about how we organize labor, and we haven't talked about allocation. But suppose I say, well, I want a place to live, and I want food, just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I also really like swimming, so I'm going to swim all day. Mm -hmm. Now, is everybody going to say that's okay? Or is everybody going to say, no, that's not okay? It, no, no, no. But I'm not saying that I'm not saying that that there would be a person who is going to do that and that would be acceptable. But there might be somebody who says, I actually want to spend half my day swimming and I don't mind if I live in a smaller house or a smaller this. You're saying that aligns perfectly with, yes, with your that's concept. The, that's, that's exactly what it is. But it's but you don't get income for doing nothing and you don't get income for doing useless activity. You get income for doing socially valuable labor and. Uh, now, if you can't work, well, then you get a full income and you get medical stuff and so, you know that even even a modestly humane uh, capitalist system has some of that that stuff. Sure. So of course, it's it's basically you you get income for duration, intensity, and onerousness of socially valued labor if you can work. If you can't work, um, then you just get a full income uh, because you're you're not shirking. You're you're just unable for some reason. Okay, but the, but the idea is that yes, you can work longer or less long, and you would do that because you want more of the social product, a bigger share of it, or you're satisfied with less and more leisure. Actually, it's sort of interesting. Um, in straight economics, uh, they say there's this le leisure um, work trade-off. Um, and it doesn't really exist in, in regular economics um, because basically you take a job and you get it for 30 hours or 40 hours or 45 hours or 50 hours. And there really isn't much choice and you don't have the means to choose. In a participatory economy, there really is such a thing. That is to say the workforce is in essence collectively deciding how much do we value that social product as compared to how much do we value our time. Um, do we want to work less hours, uh, get less stuff, but have more time uh, to en enjoy our existence? And, you know, some people would say to me, well, okay, so how many hours are people going to work in a participatory economy? <laughs> and I would say back, I don't know. And none of us know. What we need is a system which allows people to make choices like that. We don't need to decide for them. In fact, it would be wrong for us to even think about deciding for them. It's not our place. What is our place is to try and create an economy in which they will be able to decide for themselves. True. All right, let's jump to balanced job complexes. Uh, this wasn't just new, but, you know, it could, could be sort of entering into uncharted territory. Is that so? Uh, why does it matter? And what is the class implications of balanced job complexes? Yeah, this is, this is, I think, um, one of the places where 
I guess participatory economics spells out that remunerative norm a bit a bit more uh, than had been done before. Maybe somebody did. I don't know. Um, and it varies also from the anarchist norm, from each according to ability to each according to need. It's not that. Um, uh, because that says basically, well, you work up to your ability and you take whatever you want. And in participatory economics, you don't take whatever you want. You have an income. You have a share that's a justified, equitable share of the income. Okay, so balanced job complexes. Well, that comes about because, okay, we've said something about remuneration, but we haven't said anything about work. And the critical, to, at least to my mind, the first critical dimension of work is how do you organize it? work involves tasks that's true that's just a truism work involves tasks a job is a combination of tasks it's a it's a collection of tasks um, that a person does and if we look at our society and if we looked at the old soviet union uh, also we would find the same thing it's they basically have the same division of labor and so do the other um, economies that have been called 20th century socialist and capitalist um, have this division of labor, which is that we take uh, an array of empowering tasks, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, and we combine them into a job. And we take an array of disempowering tasks and we combine them into a job. And those are the two kinds of jobs we have. There's a set of jobs, and it turns out to be about 20% of the economy, that are empowering. And there's a set of jobs, and obviously there's some variation, but they're empowering. And there's a set of jobs that are the opposite. They're disempowering. And what I mean by empowering and disempowering is that if an empowering task is one that when you do it, you are enhancing your capacity to participate in decision making. You are, your, your activity gives you confidence. It gives you um, connections to other people. It gives you information. It gives you skills. These kinds of things are en enhanced by empowering work. Disempowering work is the opposite. It tends to fragment, fragment you. It tends to reduce the amount of information you have about the workplace and about the whole economy. It tends to, you know, to, to diminish your confidence. It tends to reduce your skills, except when they're skills for carrying out tasks that other people decide. So what difference does this make? Why, why does it matter that 20% of the jobs are empowering and 80%, roughly speaking, are disempowering? Well, the reason it matters is because I think that that distinction is a distinction with a tremendous impact. And the impact that it has is that the 20% are ready to decide and empowered to decide and inclined to decide and confident to decide and the 80% are the opposite. And the 20% wind up dominating the 80%, ruling the 80%. So that the 20% um, even if we had workers' councils, and even if we had, at least at the outset, remuneration, equitable remuneration for duration, intensity, and onerousness, even if we had those things, if we keep the old division of labor, and this is what it means to understand an institution, the corporate division of labor is a, is a structure, it's an institutional structure, and if we keep that, Regardless of our desires, it doesn't matter. It's going to have an effect. And you can see that over and over again. You can see it in, in many co-ops. You can see it, or you could see it, in uh, um, occupied factories where the, the factory is taken over. Uh, I'll tell you a story. Uh, a factory is taken over in Argentina. Hundreds of them were taken over years back. Not not tons of years back, not all that many years back. And workers um, were left with them because the economy was in trouble and the capitalists basically took a hike. And when the capitalists took a hike, what I call the coordinator class, which is the empowered workers also left because they felt, all right, this is doomed and we'll leave too. And so they would leave too, but the workers decided, okay, we're gonna take over. 
and we're going to keep it going because we want to keep our income and we want to keep our livelihood and our dignity. Or, 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 so they would take over the workplace. And when they took over the workplace, they tended to form workers' councils, literally. Uh, and they tended to institute at least democratic control. And at most, and in fact, in practice, it was very much self-management. So for instance, they didn't vote each day on what would happen in each team. The team took responsibility. Why? Because it was more effective. So they had a degree of self-management um, almost naturally. Um, but they also kept some just one person, one vote majority rule. And they changed the income, the remunerative norms also. They tended to equalize the incomes, um, which is a, not an exact participatory economic choice, but it's certainly uh, you know, moving away from the old versions and toward this version. But they kept the old division of labor. Now, that meant that the, somebody new had to do those jobs. So, you know, I, I, I was in a factory talking to a woman who was at a desk uh, in Argentina, and she was doing the bookkeeping. So, and she had be previously not been doing that, obviously. And I asked her, what were you doing before? And she said she had been uh, one of the people who worked at the furnaces, because it was a glass factory. And she described her work to me. I probably would have lasted 15 minutes trying to do it, you know, doing these ma manual um, uh, operations over and over again in, in front of an open blast furnace. And when the workers took over the workplace, they decided that they had to have somebody who was going to do the books and, and uh, be the finance person, so to speak. Nobody wanted to do it. She finally volunteered. And so she took up the task. And I, I asked her what was, what was hard about it? What was the hardest part of switching from somebody who had been doing this um, disempowering work um, for a long time and was blasted by it to, to moving over and doing this other kind of work? And she didn't want to, you know, she was sort of shy about it and she didn't want to say. And I said, well, was it, um, you know, learning to use the software that you had to use uh, on the computer. She said, no. I said, was it learning accounting concepts and, you know, how to, how to conceptualize what the task? She said, no. And I said, well, I, I, come on, tell me, I don't, I, you know, I don't know enough to ask more. What more could there be that would be worse than that? And she said, first, I had to learn to read. So she went from uh, being, you know, working at this blast furnace to be to doing the financial books for this firm, and she had to learn to read on the way to doing that. And this is this is a working class person who ostensibly is incapable of doing empowered work. So so much for that argument. But there was something else relevant in what was going on, because. Uh, in the workplace, there's about, again, 20% of the work that's empowered. And so if 20% of the workforce is doing that, even though you have uh, uh, workers' council and you have democracy or even self-management, you have equitable remuneration, you still have the 20% day by day getting more and more empowered, feeling more and more confident and in control and actually having information essential to making decisions or else the whole thing gets screwed. That's a reality. So one more story, uh, and again, it was in Argentina, but this was a meeting of, of about 50 people representing different occupied factories. And I, and I was supposed to make a presentation. And before we started, you know, we were sitting around, maybe it was 40 people. We were, anyway, we were sitting pretty much in a circle. And I said, let's just go around a little and, and because people are from all over Argentina and you can say, you know, people should say where they're from and, and uh, uh, a little bit about what's been going on at your workplace. So it started and in the beginning and before the meeting started, the place was very animated. And of course, these people were meeting each other and they were all engaged in trying to change the society. And so they were all uplifted and, and excited. 
Um, and then the first person told their story and the second person, the third. By the time we got to, I don't remember exactly, probably the fifth to the seventh, probably the seventh person, the tone in the room was morbid. It, it, was, it was maudlin. It was quiet and depressed. And um, there were some people who were even crying. And the seventh person, so I can't talk about it. The seventh person said, um, you know, I never thought I would say anything like this, but we took over the workplace. We instituted democratic control. We equalized the wages. We voted for our foreman and our, uh, our leadership. Um, and it's not that long, six months later, and all the old crap is coming back. And at that point, I stopped it, and we, we started to discuss. And I said, you know, I, I know that what you're telling me is that you feel that, it, it, that it's human nature. You feel that you made these changes, and even though you made these changes, all the old crap is coming back. It's, it, you know, what was the point? Um, it, it's becoming as alienated as it was. It's becoming as, as uh, you know, authoritarian as it was. And um, I have no doubt that that's true, but it's not because of human nature. It's because although you changed many key aspects, you kept the old division of labor. And over time, the old division of labor created a class division. And even though the person who was doing the books, as that example, had grown up working class and was working class and started out the project with the same same values and the same inclinations and the same hopes and desires and energy as everybody else, she became um, more empowered, more confident, more skilled, and a coordinator class person. And so you feel all the old crap coming back. And what you're saying really is the division of labor, the class division between coordinators and workers is what's coming back. And even though you don't have the same, you don't have the owner there. Um, because the owner's gone, you still have that hierarchy and the alienation and the, you know, the disempowerment and the subordination. And that is a description not only of workplaces in Argentina, where they keep the old division of labor, but it was also a description of workplaces in the Soviet Union and in other 20th century socialist countries, which often with the best motives, sometimes not so good, but often really good, um, nonetheless kept the old division of labor and the old division of labor corrupted the other aspirations. And so that's another institution that needs to change. Okay. So what's the solution? Well, how does it matter for activism was going to be more of my question following well, before this. I didn't, I didn't explain what the alternative to that was. Um, I know it's going on for a while, but I want to make the case, you know, yeah. We can, um, uh, the alternative to that is I used to I used to use as an analogy. Suppose you go to another planet and you discover that in in the other planet, um, in the workplaces, about twenty percent of the people rule about eighty percent, and it's pretty graphic. And you can see it, and you can see that they earn more and that they dominate. And you discover prowling around a little that the twenty percent at the beginning of the day eat a Hershey bar, a chocolate bar and the 80% don't. And you discover that on this planet, the Hershey bar has tremendous impact on your confidence and your skills and your, your vocal connections to others and your ties and your, your knowledge. And so you deduce, well, that the chocolate bar distribution is what's causing this hierarchy in all the workplaces. And then if somebody asks what the solution is, you know the answer right away share the chocolate. Um, and I would do this with, you know, kids and they share the chocolate. It's pretty obvious. If you share the chocolate, nobody is going to dominate due to having monopolized the chocolate. Um, you might want to produce more chocolate also, and you might want to reduce the non you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, that tells you balanced job complexes they aren't that hard to figure out. There's nothing complicated about it. If empowering tasks are monopolized into the jobs of the coordinator class, the solution 
is to distribute those empowering plant tasks, just like you distribute the chocolate to everybody. And that means balanced job complexes, meaning that each person has a mix of tasks that are suitable to be a job, you know, where they combine together sensibly, um, the person can do them. And a subset of them are empowering and a subset of them are disempowering in such a way that each person in the economy who's working is comparably empowered by their work to participate. And therefore we don't have the division of labor essentially overthrowing by its intrinsic impact upon people any effort to to have real participation, real self-management, to have classlessness. And so that was the that was the origins of uh, balanced job complexes. It's probably the most, I don't know whether it's the most controversial part, but it certainly does arouse serious passions in some circles who perceive, uh-oh, this means that I'm going to have to do a balanced job complex in a good economy, whereas in this economy, I'm doing only empowering tasks. Mm-hmm. And that's true. Sure. The same way the capitalists lose their ownership, the coordinator class loses its monopoly on empowering work. Now, how about one of the things I'm thinking, as you say that, and I'm assuming other people have probably brought this up in the past, would be, you mentioned somebody like Noam or a Michael Jordan, for instance. Um, what if uh, somebody like a Noam, or let's say like a Stephen Hawking, because it's somebody we don't know. So let's say somebody like a Stephen Hawking, well, that's a bad example too. Michael be- Jordan? <laughs> now, because he's somewhat limited in terms of, what he can do physically as well, but his intellectual capacity is, you know, off the charts. In other words, I guess what I'm saying is like, I want Stephen Hawking to just go sit in a corner and develop stuff. I don't want him, you know, answering phones or anything like that. I don't mind answering phones so Stephen can go do what he needs to do. You know what I mean? I'm and convince you that you do. That, that, that what's that? matter to you, okay? Um the reason is because you can't, you can't isolate one aspect and look only at that and feel like you're getting a full picture, right? So in other words, when somebody says to me, well, wait a minute, Michael, if you have balanced job complexes, mm-hmm. then let's take a, a, a larger scale example. Um, that means surgeons have to clean bedpans or whatever it is that they have to do to compose a balanced job complex. They're going to do somewhat less surgery and somewhat more of this other stuff, Mm -hmm. right? And so however many surgeons we have, um, you know, a hundred thousand, whatever it is, N surgeons, um, they're all doing um, not only surgery. Let's make believe that before they were only doing surgery, which of course isn't true. They're playing golf some of the time and they're doing paperwork, but set it aside. If they were doing surgery 40 hours a week and now they are only doing surgery 20 hours a week, society just lost 20 hours. They, we just lost half the surgery, mm-hmm. right? Disaster. Forget about losing Stephen Hawking's insight or Gnome's insight. We just lost half the surgery in the society. How can that possibly be a good choice, right? So Margaret Thatcher is laughing, laughing and saying, um, well, Michael, you know, maybe it's humane, maybe it's uh, caring and ethical, but it's idiotic because there is no alternative. It doesn't work. You're robbing us of surgery. You're also robbing us of everything else that is, is produced by empowering work. But that's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because the 80%, remember that woman who was in front of the blast furnace and then was doing the books, the 80% are not capable of only what they are doing. Sure. But they're certainly not capable of what Stephen Hawking does. No, that's true. Right. Um, But then again, you don't need 80% to be capable of what Stephen Hawking is doing. But we'd want more of that 80%. We only need one or two or three because we only have one or two or three Stephen Hawkings or Noam Chomsky's, right? Or Michael Jordan's. That we know so, of, yeah. So the question is, among the 80%, right? Yeah. Are there some more? Right. Genius, right. Let's call it. Right. And the answer is, of course there are. Of course, are. yeah. And we, how do we know there are? Well, if we go back 50 years and you look at, whether you're looking at geniuses or you're looking at surgeons, right? It's all white and male. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not because 
blacks and you know other non-whites and women couldn't contribute it's not because they couldn't do empowering work <clears throat> and it's not because there aren't to be found among them geniuses it's because of the social structure <clears throat> of racism and sorry <coughs> of racism and sexism and in the case of what we're talking about classism right the right. the it's it's essentially the same idea the reason why the coordinator class dominates and the reason why the working class is left not doing uh, significant amounts of of empowered work creative work uh, at, and the rest is because of social structures it's not because of intrinsic incapacities just as was the case with women and blacks now i'm going to go a step further and say um, if society only has you know four geniuses of every variety and if we had a capitalist system or a market coordinator system, a system with this division of labor, we could find those four or 10 or 50, whatever it is, right? And so you were right that the switch, right, would mean that we would lose some of their output. And if in losing some of their output, it would not be replaced <clears throat> by people from the 80%, which I deny, I think it would be, and far more. But even if that were true, I'd still be for it. Because there's another dimension to it. There's class struggle. There's there's the subordination of, you know, in other words, we're not getting, we're getting a whole different system with whole different values, with whole different outcomes. And to say that it costs us something in some attribute doesn't offset all those gains. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is I don't think it costs us anything in productivity. Um, and I don't think it costs us anything in the number of people who are creative who will find. Uh, some would think so. And I suppose I could imagine a participatory economy which, uh, in which, I don't know, you know, uh, Hawking is a bad example because he's, that's all he can do. Sure. Um, um, but, you know, in which Noam doesn't do anything but linguistics or, you know, some surgeon who's absolutely off the charts great mm -hmm. does nothing but surgery. Um, I suppose I could imagine that, but I don't think it'll happen. I think that once um, humanity discovers classlessness and seeks it, uh, it will be across the board. And so what would be some of the other main, because uh, we're going to move on to participatory planning, but I'm interested in what other people have brought up in turn. You said it was per perhaps the most controversial part, the balanced job oh, complexes. Balanced job complex. Yeah, what, what would be some of the other opposition well, to that? that you it's, it's mainly the one that you've said, but it takes a different form often. So sometimes, for example, uh, uh, artists, um, musicians, film people, et cetera, et cetera, they tend to say, wait a second, it, it, it goes beyond, uh, it, it, it requires participatory planning to get their full criticism. So I'm going to leave that for a minute. Okay. Um, main criticism of balanced job complexes is, is um, it's, it's denying people uh, the full focusing of their of their energies at doing what they want and it's therefore it's constraining people in some sense and it is uh, um, losing output um, because and some people will say well the 80 percent can't do it in other words they'll say look you just cut surgery in half and um, the 80 percent even even with you know, better income and therefore better home life and, and better education and all the rest of it can't do it. Um, they just can't. The, the distribution of uh, attributes among humanity is such that 20% can do what's empowering and 80% can't. Now, that's just so false and so classist, um, but it's very commonplace that, that people believe that, um, including people in the, in the, uh, 80 percent sure. just like once upon a time um many women um still some 
um, felt that women couldn't do all sorts of things, which they obviously can. And blacks felt that blacks can't do all sorts of things, which they obviously can. Um, it, if it look, it, if you, if you went back 50 years and you put all the surgeons in a stadium, you know, a big stadium, uh, there would, there would be a smattering of women and blacks and it would be basically white men. Uh, and the people outside the women and the blacks, well, there's, there's a question of it. There's a, there's an explanation of it that seems obvious, right? Um, they can't do it. The reason why they're not in there is because they just don't belong in there. They can't do it. So that's the first, you know, that's the first obvious answer. Six-year-olds aren't doing surgery either. Why not? Well, because they can't do it. So that's a natural answer. Um, so then you have to look and discover, well, wait a minute. Um, 50 years ago, you had to look and discover, wait a minute. On the one hand, it seems to me from my personal experience that that's a bit obnoxious. And it also seems to me that we can see cases where they can and it doesn't seem like there's any biological reason for, and so on and so forth but it's 50 years later now and so there's a simpler explanation or there's a simpler argument against the idiocy and that's well they're doing it um uh it, it, women are being surgeons and doctors and blacks are being surgeons and doctors and so on and so forth and we can see the diminished impact of you know the structures on preventing them mm -hmm. And the same thing is true for workers, but it's only in rarer circumstances. And it's, you know, that's a battle that's still, you know, the other two battles aren't won, but they're pretty far along. You know, they've made great progress. The, the battle for working people, that is disempowered employees um, to gain empowerment and to play their rightful role, that's still to come. Uh, Let's... But, People, people do deny it. Yeah. No, I, I, um, I would assume those would be the the initial reactions to it, and then I, I had a for another question, but I'll wait because I think this is something we can get into in the future. But I'm interested in sort of the transitionary process that would have to take place. In other words, you have people who have been, uh, say, so beat down by the system that. Like, in other words, if we all start out as like a blank slate, then I, I sort of totally agree with everything you're saying. What I'm thinking about as you're saying what you're saying is finding someone in the conditions that they've been put in by this system and then turning around some of those conditions to allow the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, well, that, you know, there's this word transition, meaning the, the path or the journey from what you're suffering to what you're later enjoying right and right i mean that has to occur and it, it it's you you can't the woman in the in the um in the, you know the argentine factory could go from the blast furnace to doing the books uh in say six months and she was particularly astute and maybe she had some background that gave her some confidence i don't know right mm -hmm. but you can't go from um uh, cleaning bedpans to doing brain surgery overnight um, that's true. And you can't go and, and there are many such examples, but you can, uh, begin to significantly alter the social relations of work with an eye on with, you know, with the clear aim of attaining balanced job complexes. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly true that, um, for example, having a balanced job complex has implications for education, obviously. Sure. Right. It means that everybody must be educated. You know, it's sort of like the army advertisement to be the best you can be. Um, that's literally not a crazy phrase. Right. You should be educated to fulfill your capacities. That's not what happens in our system. But why not? In our system, 20 percent are going to be empowered and 80 percent are going to be disempowered. So 20 percent have to be educated. In other words, in public schools and in high school and then in whatever follows that, college or whatever, they have to be educated to fit into that pattern. They have to, um, on the one hand, expect to rule at, at, at some level, and on the other hand, have the confidence and the knowledge and the skills um, that are associated with it or that are at least um, ready to learn on the job to do it. Sure. But the other 80%, they have to go through school and they have to be acclimated to taking orders. 
they have to have their capacities diminished by school. That's what the school system has to do in order to accommodate the society into which people are graduating. So the school, you can predict that the school system is going to treat 80% differently from 20% roughly, right? And, and that, uh, you know, a large number of people are going to go through school with their eyes on the clock to get out of the class punished for paying no attention or punished for leaving or punished for getting, you know, for being noisy or something, all things that aren't good in the workplace, um, but not punished for getting a great grade. Nobody ever gets punished in a public school system for getting a bad grade, right? That's fine. Why is that fine? Because you don't need to get good grades for where you're going to wind up. You don't need to learn anything except how to endure boredom and how to take orders. That's what balanced job complexes requires of 80% of the population. Endure boredom and take orders and don't, don't by all means have the desire to fulfill your capacities. You meant to say a lack of balanced job complexes. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, just to be clear for those who are watching and listening, <laughs> that's not what balanced job complexes create. The next part that I want to jump to, I think is becoming less and less controversial here in the U S through a new period now of socialist thought, uh, people who are critical of capitalism, and that is participatory planning. Now, what some people would, you know, we could get to central planning, we could talk about why this is a critical aspect and why not markets, but I do think that this is less and less controversial. I don't know if you would agree with that, but it seems to me that there's more and more of a discussion about not allowing markets to run our lives and that the government at its, you know, this is the most elementary sort of explanation would be that the government... Uh, should have a role in planning the economy. I, I think there's more openness to that. I think you're right. Um, I don't think the openness is coming because people are looking at planning and seeing it's positive. You know, it's almost like Biden versus versus Trump, right? So in other words, I don't think people are voting positively for something new. They are coming to the conclusion or they're gravitating toward the view that what we have is so damn bad that we need, that we got to do something else, right? Um, so I agree that, that that sentiment is growing and is, is somewhat new, uh, at least in, uh, to the extent that it, it is widespread. Um, it, it creates an opening. Uh, it does create an opening for people to be not so market fundamentalist, but I don't want to exaggerate the extent to which it's the case. Mm -hmm. um, markets still have a very, very strong hold on people. And there are lots of reasons why. One reason is because the word market connotes to people a place where you get stuff. And so if somebody says uh, we should get rid of markets, what they hear is that you're saying uh, we should get rid of the place where you go to get stuff. Um, well, that's a disaster. All right. So what, what then happens? Uh, somebody drives up to my house and gives me whatever they want to give me and then they go away and I'm stuck with it. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, you, you, there's an element of freedom that's associated with markets and even of participation that's, that's associated with markets. The trouble is that that's not the essence of markets. Uh, markets are a horrendous institution. Uh, yeah. I call myself a market abolitionist um, in the same way that somebody would be a, an abolitionist with respect to slavery, because I think markets are indeed at that level of destructiveness of human potentials. Um, I don't know how much time you want to spend on markets. No, I think um, it's important. I, well, I think it's really important because it underpins the whole ideology that runs our country. Well, a market is a system in which buyers and sellers interact and um, the, the buyer is trying to do as well as the buyer can and the seller is trying to do as well as the seller can. And that means the seller is trying to um, um, sell at a high price and give less for it. And the buyer is trying to pay a lower price and get more for it. And it's a kind of a zero sum contest. So that's one problem. It's very individualist and it creates um, a, a degree of individualism that's astounding. Um, another reason for that is because the, the, in the calculation between the buyer and the seller, and the buyer can be an institution or an individual, and likewise for the seller, the, the, the 
the interaction between the buyer and the seller takes nobody else into account. The buyer takes into account the buyer and tries to fleece the seller. The seller takes into account the seller and tries to fleece the buyer. It's a, it's a rat race and everybody knows it and that's what it's called. Uh, and so what you have is this sort of antisocial dynamic which creates this nasty, not health, not healthy individualism. So that's one problem. And another problem is that what's outside the immediate transaction doesn't impact the transaction. So as a result, if I'm selling a car and you're buying a car, the person who's going to smell the pollution is not involved, right? The person who it doesn't matter what we're talking about, the external effects, they're called externalities by economists and economists understand this. Um, they just don't see how widespread it is, um, aren't accounted for. And this is, this is what gets us into, um, or at least part of what gets us into along with profit seeking, um, uh, the, you know, the ecological disasters that we have. The profit seeking aspect is if I can make more profit by dumping my waste on the community, which isn't involved in the transaction, well, I'm going to do that because if I don't do that in the marketplace, I'm out competed. So everybody is propelled, pushed to do these things. It's like, you know, the, the, uh, uh, corporate division of labor pushed us into these class divisions. The market system does something relatively similar. Anyway, there's a lot of things to say about markets. Here, here's a subtle thing about markets, which I think is true. Um, Yugoslavia used to be a market socialist country. So a market socialist country is one in which uh, the state um, uh, does a whole lot of administration, but the allocation system that it uses, the way it it, it the way the economy determines how much of this and that is produced and consumed and so on and where it goes is a market. Um, unlike, say, the Soviet version of socialism, of coordinatorism, I would say, in which a central plan does that. So in, in Yugoslavia, you have that market. So imagine you're in a workplace and imagine you have participatory economic type values. So you have a workers' council you believe in worker self-management, maybe you even have balanced job complexes and you remunerate equitably, but you're operating on the, on the market. And so if you produce bicycles or violins or whatever it is that you produce, if you don't sell them on the market, you've got no income to distribute equally or fairly among the workers. So you have to, you have to compete for income and you do. And you compete in all the familiar ways. Um, you advertise and try and trick people into buying it. You dump your pollution to reduce your costs. You use speed up against the workforce. You don't have air conditioning um, in the place where people are working. You only have it for the upper levels and so on. And now, since you had balanced job complexes, you have a problem. This is sort of subtle. Some people would disagree with it. I think it's valid. Um, in your workplace, your workers' council meets, and it realizes that it has to compete for surplus, not profit anymore, because there's no owner, but surplus to divide among the workforce. And if it gets outcompeted, it's going to go out of business. So they realize that they have to do all these things that are nasty. They want to set up daycare, but they can't, because the other company won't set it up, and they'll get outcompeted. They want to pay attention to their pollution, but they can't because the other company won't and they'll get outcompeted. And now they have a problem because they are not very good at oppressing themselves. They are not, these, these working people with balanced jobs and with equitable remuneration and with a democratic or a self-managing say, they don't want to hurt themselves. They want the daycare. They're just not good about thinking about how to, how to, how to increase uh, the surplus by diminishing themselves. And so what do they need to do? They need to hire some experts to do that. And where do they go to find those experts? Well, to the Harvard Business School or Oxford or Cambridge or wherever. They go to places where people have taught, have been taught to not care at all about the well-being 
of the victims of their policies. And so they hire some of those people and they bring them into the workplace. Now, if you give some of those people a balanced job, it's not going to work because they're not going to cut off their own air conditioning. They're not going to speed up their own workday. They're not going to oppress themselves. So you got to immunize them. So them, you, you have to protect them from the decisions that you want them to make. So you give them a corner office and you give them air conditioning and you give them a rug and you, and you give them reasonable hours and all the rest of it. And then you say, okay, go ahead, fuck us. And mm. that's what the market forces you into. Right. Now that's an extreme scenario, but I think it's real. Markets are like, like the way we discovered that the corporate division of labor against the desires of, it could be everybody in the workplace imposes a class division in the workplace. Markets do that also. They just also destroy the ecology and, and uh, you know, create remuneration for bargaining power and various other features. Okay, so we're in a society and um, people are beginning to realize that markets might not be so great. And so they start to think about planning. Well, okay. And in Yeah, why not economics, central planning? Well, yeah. So in, in participatory economics, we have to think about it too. And the answer, the, the, the right question is the one you just asked. If we're going to throw out markets, okay, fine. But what's left seems to be central planning. And that's what people were saying back when we were starting participatory economics. There was a famous guy who wrote a book back then, a guy named Alec Noel, basically saying, you know, you, you can have planning or you can have markets, but you can probably have some combination of them or you can die, but that's it. Um, and so if that is it, then you would have to just choose between them and suck it up and endure the pain. What's wrong with central planning is that it's authoritarian. And it, again, breeds this coordinator class, working class distinction. Central planning is very simple. A central planning apparatus tells the workforce, tells all the workplaces, right? All the factories and so on and so forth. This is what we want you to do. And the workplaces and the factories send back a response. It isn't sort of instant dictation. So the central planners get some information. And then they send back another, and another response. And then they send back an order, do this. And, and what you have is a hierarchy. And not only that, the central planners don't want to, quite naturally, don't want to negotiate with workers' councils, where the workers who are going to be, you know, uh, have their own agendas and their own interests are going to battle with the planners. So instead, they put in each workplace, they want to have in each workplace a sector of people who is like them. Like them means educated, credentialed, a coordinator class. And that's what you see in central planning. So centrally planned socialism and market socialism um, both had the coordinator class, working class division of labor and coordinator class rule. And of course, they also had the corporate division of labor cementing it. Um, so there seems to be so a question. We didn't want either one. So we were stuck, right? Right. Uh, you know, well, uh-oh. You know, if we're not going to have markets and we're not going to have central planning, what do we do? And so we had to think up a new, a new approach to allocation. Would there be roles? I'm trying to think about sort of centralized mechanisms as much as centralized planning. So in other words, we're living in a time with great ecological crises. It would seem to me that the challenge would be distributing proper information to as many of the workers' councils as possible. And then what would the institutions look like that could gather that information and disseminate it? Um, That's right. So, you know, yeah. like thinking here, like in other words, you could have workers' councils throughout the Western Hemisphere doing amazing work, but then if everyone in the Eastern Hemisphere is living in a market system that's destroying the environment and so on, it's, that creates a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not that this is, again, I mean, there there's tons of problems with the existing system. I'm just thinking of things that would come up in people's thoughts about no, what are, are there good elements? I mean, I don't think many people think there are good elements to authoritarianism. Although, you know, this is another context, say the pandemic. Uh, again, if everyone has equal information and everyone's given the right amount of information about the pandemic, then we're not concerned that people won't be able to make good choices. But the reality is people aren't getting that information. 
So now there is an element of authoritarianism that has to take place in terms of fining people for not following protocol, all these types of things. Well, that's not all right. Let's let's um. The example. I would assume I, you're going to run into this. In other words, we're always going to run into situations where there's going to be a need for authoritarianism. I would say. I don't think that there's going to ever be a point where we, where people are going to always make the best decisions in everyone's best interest all the time. Yeah, but that's not. You're clearly right about the second part of that, right? Yeah. So, for instance, the argument against self-management that gets made. Um, which I guess maybe we should have taken up earlier, but the argument against it that gets made is sort of what a, a, an initial variant on what you're saying, and then it grows to what you're saying. The initial argument against it is, well, wait a minute. If everybody is having a say in decisions in proportion to the degree they're affected, some people are better at decision-making. Some people know more. Some people have relevant expertise, even with balanced job complexes. Right. Some people have that relevant expertise. The pandemic is a case in point. Um, I, I might be a, a, a writer or whatever I am um, with a balanced job complex, but I'm not a virologist or epidemiologist or whatever it is. And I don't know Jack from, I, you know, I the, the notion that we're all just going to say what we want, tally it up. And, and that's the, the result would be a debacle, somebody would say. And that's true, uh, but in order, to, but self-management doesn't mean no expertise, right? So take a much simpler version of that. Suppose we're in a workplace and it's time to paint the walls and it's a while ago. And um, one of the people there or who we consult is a chemist. And it turns out that we all like this color maroon which has lead in it. And if we all decided based on the color that we like and the mood that it puts us in, we would have lead paint on the walls or maybe something worse than lead. Mm -hmm. And so we need the knowledge. So we consult the expertise and the expert tells us that. Now, should the expert make that decision for us? No, there's no reason for that. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why we should Give the person who has, you know. I, no, no, no. I totally agree with that part. My, my question would be, okay. what if the workers then decide that they still want to, even with good knowledge? There's nothing that suggests that human beings are always going to make good decisions with good knowledge at all. So well, my question with that is, what is the check on workers who are going to inevitably make decisions that go against what experts tell them to do? I mean, we see this even on like the smallest scale in the most democratic of situations. Yeah, well, I, I don't think I agree with you. Um, to say that people will make mistakes is true. Yeah, right? but Certainly some mistakes are larger than others. Like if you true. make a mistake at Chernobyl, it's different than if you make a mistake at the local Ford plant. That's true. But Chernobyl is not run by and, and administered by people who are ignorant of what's on Chernobyl. Right. Well, that, the people who work. It there, was the story of it was that <laughs> right? because we, of bureaucracy and because of centralized planning. <laughs> all of that's gone. So it wouldn't be that if you're working in those kinds of situations, it's because because you have to do socially respond, socially desired work. Right. So in the same way that I can't fill up holes and dig them in my backyard and get an income for it. I also can't be, um, you know, the shortstop of the Yankees. Why can't I? I want to. You can't because because my doing that is not producing anything that anybody socially values. Nobody wants to watch me play shortstop, right? <laughs> okay. But somebody else. Also, but somebody uh, would want to watch maybe somebody else. Yes, of course. Yeah. So in other words, there. It's but somebody who could do it well enough. Right. 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 <laughs> okay. And the same thing goes for working in Chernobyl or in a hospital, say, mm -hmm. um, or whatever it is. The, the people who are doing certain kinds of tasks and certain kinds of, of work have to be doing it well enough for it to be socially valued for them to get an income for it. So take the, uh, you know, the pandemic. Um, uh, if we literally had a, a uh, participatory economic world, what would the result be? Would we be able to uh, um, uh, 
you know, have popular decisions in light of informed information? Well, I think the answer is yes, unless time pressure presents it. So for example, imagine that we're, um, you know, we live on the coastline and there's a, uh, a tsunami coming, right? Well, I, I, hello, I'm not in favor of us all sitting around and having a coffee clutch and making a decision. I'm in favor of the people who've dealt with tsunamis being in charge and all of us following, right? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's not a structural condition that exists forever. It's an emergency. The, right? So, the, but this gets straight back into what we're about to talk about, which is ecology. I mean, there's a few more questions before I wanted to get to ecology. My point would be, planning either, but go ahead. no, 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 no. We, I mean, we talked a little bit about central planning, but I wanted to talk about, um, what else do we have? No, I'm, I'm saying we didn't talk about, we didn't talk about the alternative. The alternative of what is participatory planning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go, let's go into that. that. Something else you want to do, that's fine. No, 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 no. Go ahead, because I got the question. The the point you bring up about emergencies makes me think about ecology, but go ahead and let's finish the alternative and how that would look. Okay. Um, and even how it applies in our activism. Well, I, well, let me preface it by saying I think all that we've done so far applies in our activism also. Well, yeah. We mentioned that for councils just briefly. Um, yeah. But balanced job complexes have huge implications or I think they have huge implications, just like um, being anti-racist or anti-sexist does. So if you're anti-racist or anti-sexist, you don't put up with the division of labor in your organization, or you shouldn't anyway, with a division of, with a way of dividing up tasks in your organization, division of labor, which is racist or sexist, right? You, you shouldn't do that. And, and the reasons you shouldn't do that is because it, first of all, underutilizes capacities and second of all, it creates a movement that, um, you know, is unattractive to or repellent to uh, women or blacks. Uh, and it also makes the movement incapable of having good program around those things because its members are so jaundiced in defending their own advantages. And the same thing is true for class. So if you, if you have, let's, I mean, an area where I'm, familiar. So let's say you have a media institution and you organize it like Time Magazine, but without the owners. Uh, in other words, you have a division of labor, which monopolizes the empowering tasks in relatively few hands, let's say 20%. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, on the one hand, you've got 80% of the people who are working for who are alienated and resistant and not, not trying to put out, they're trying to, to hold back um, and they're, they're depressed and, and uh, oppressed by the circumstances. So that's one problem. But there's another problem. And that is that because you have that structure, it becomes very hard to have a pro to, to write about, in other words, to publish about, uh, to have your media cover issues of coordinator class oppression and working uh, or coordinator class uh, domination and working class oppression. It's not likely, just like once upon a time, left organizations that were profoundly racist and sexist did not have good discussion uh, or media groups that were that way didn't have good publication around those issues because, it, because the people in charge didn't want to um, and didn't understand and were predisposed in other directions. The same thing with class. And so what you have is, um, and then finally, of course, it also is repulsive uh, to people. And, and, you know, once upon a time, well, let's just make it now. The, the, the question, where are all the workers on the left, um, is pretty easy to in part answer. They're not here because it's more painful to be in an organization that's talking about justice and equity and fairness and, and freedom which is treating you like dirt than it is even to be in society treated like dirt, because at least in society, it's not masquerading as something that it isn't. Mm -hmm. So um, I think balanced job complexes have huge implications in the short term. In the long term, the implication is relatively straightforward. Instead of, uh, uh, of movements which 
um, support the interests of, elaborate the interests of, and eventually empower and even make the ruling class of the coordinator class, you want movements that really are about uh, liberating the whole population and getting rid of the coordinated worker distinction, just like they get rid of the capital labor distinction. And that's a tremendous implication uh, for short run and long run. You can also see it in Trump's appeal, or I believe you can see it in Trump's appeal. Um, and in why, you know, many working people turn away from the Democratic Party, the party that basically is, um, has the mannerisms of, the style of, and to a considerable degree, a very considerable degree, serves the interests of the coordinator class, professionals, managers, lawyers, doctors, engineers, and so on. Right. All right. Um, I got off on that and I forgot. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. We were going to go back to uh, participatory planning. Here's the deal. We're at an hour 45 and we're halfway through. So what do you want? Do you want to stop with, how about this? Do you want to stop? Do you want to stop with participatory planning? I mean, we're going to edit this. I so don't worry about this, but do you want to stop with participatory planning and start off with ecology next time? Or do you want us to finish off with ecology and start off with uh, the whole vision participatory economics sometimes dismissed as a blueprint is actually not all that detailed. Why is that? And then we would go on the second set of questions. Whatever you want. No, well, yeah. <laughs> what do you, what do you want? I, I, I really don't. Uh, it doesn't matter either way to you. Ecology. Well, I, actually you have to do participatory planning, I think because ecology, uh, is largely impacted by the kind of allocation system that right. you have. Okay, so let's and let's keep talking about, let's finish out participatory planning or, or start on that because we just talked about centralized planning. You went back to balanced job complexes. Um, round out participatory planning, well, talk about ecology, and we'll end it there for today. Okay, you... you That'll you be two actually, hours. You actually summarized, I suppose you could say, or you, you brought up... Um, a observation that I think is totally germane. It was that, well, what allocation has to do in some sense involves information, right? If you're going to have workers' councils and individual workers and consumers' councils and individual consumers, and they're going to be self-managing and they're going to manifest their preferences, um, well, how are they going to do that? What what are they going to use to know or to arrive at desires, to arrive at proposals, to arrive at their, um, their formulation of what they want to do, what they want to consume, what they want to produce. Um, and so if you ask that question and then you look at a workplace and you say the same question, somehow the workplace has to get feedback or information about what consumers want. It doesn't do any good for the workers to all sit around and decide, well, we want to produce, you know, 12,000 bicycles if consumers only want 8,000, um, or we want to include produce 8,000 and consumers want 12,000. That's a big problem. It doesn't do any good if they don't get any feedback regarding whether or not what they're doing with the product is meeting needs, is, is valued, right? Um, and that's, well, I won't. Uh, so, so there, this information has to flow, and at the at the simplest level, the information that has to flow is from the workers about what they are inclined to want to do in their workplaces, given their resources and their tools, given their tools, um, because they're going to have to get the resources from the planning process. You know, and I, I get steel from someplace else, I get water from someplace else, I get oil from some whatever it is. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to get that information and that information is going to somehow cause me to, um, to modify my, my desires in light of it. And the same thing on the consumer side. If the consumers in a, in a market system, of course, the workers basically hear nothing about the consumers and the consumers hear nothing about the workers. Um, and which is why when a consumer goes into to a store, it's a totally individualist closed decision, except if movements intervene. 
So in other words, you don't, you don't know what the situation of the workers who produce the good that you buy is. You don't know what the true social costs and benefits or environmental effects are. But if you were going to... You're decide, saying that now under this system. Yeah, now. But right. I mean, that to some degree, I, I mean, I think people probably do. In other words, when I go to a gas station, I know I also have friends who work at a gas station. So I'm not ignorant to like the fact that the gas is destroying the environment or that the worker has a totally shitty job and a plot in life where they're yeah, you know all those things because of of resistance because of of uh social movements well i don't I mean, know about think, that i mean i there's a is. lot of just in the popular culture people are like yeah this job sucks how did it get into the popular culture it wasn't always there right yeah it, it, it's a function of, of movements that have, have made known and been aggressive about, you know, oil and the impact of it and so on and so forth. I mean, just think of something else. Um, you go in and you buy some food or you buy some um, clothing or you buy some. Now, how many people who do that know anything about the plight of the people who are producing it? Right. Very few. You I don't do. know. You I don't do. know. I think a lot of people might know. I mean, I think that there's a lot of people in this country who have a good idea about a lot of things, like just how shitty it is that if they think about it for one second, nobody, you can't ask anybody in this country, do you think the person putting your shoes together is living a good life or a shitty life? Most people are going to say, oh God, the people who stitch my clothes, yeah, they're fucked. And, and is there anything they can do about it? I mean, yeah, uh, not really. I mean, not within the system. Not I mean, within the system. Yeah, I mean, they could organize, but form a movement, they can organize. Right, sure, right. But there's nothing they can do. So when they go into the store, they really have the choice of getting the item or not getting the item. Right, right, right. And the price that they're using to do that is the price that the market sets. And if we go back to understand. Remember how we said how remuneration in this system was a function of bargaining power mm -hmm. and those workers who certainly in sweatshops, but even not in the sweatshops have very little bargaining power. And so the part of the price that is their income, right, is very low. And so the pr relative to what it should be. And so the price is lower. And so I can either pay that low price or not, but nothing that I do is going to change it. Right. Yeah. And so it, what what's desirable is that it, a price is a useful thing so in other words a price of a computer or of anything else if it embodies if it's a congealed representation of the true social costs and benefits so in other words it really takes into account the real effects on working people right who, who produce it it really takes into account the materials that are used and the effects on the ecology. If it does all that, then, then my deciding whether or not I can afford it is sensible because it's, it's basically, you know, deciding whether I want something that costs all this much, meaning it has all these negative effects, right? That's, that's okay. And, and uh, as a worker, if, if I know, you know, that the, the, the product I'm producing is saving people's lives, that's different than if I know that the product, or it ought to be different than if I know that the product that I'm producing is doing something ludicrous, right? So the difference between um, not all of cosmetic surgery, but let's say three quarters of cosmetic surgery and, um, you know, medical care for serious diseases, right? two very different things mm -hmm. in our system the, the difference is that the former are more profitable right. and so the former are pursued and more and more of it is pursued and pushed and the latter especially if it's if it's medical care for the poor is uh, diminished right mm -hmm. but that's because of the market what if what if the the I mean, it, it starts to get hard or long-winded, I suppose. I guess I'm long-winded about everything. But it, it starts to get hard because you have to take into account various factors. But if things are properly priced and if the, the dynamic of allocation, which we haven't described yet, arrives at those good representations of true social and ecological and personal costs and benefits, 
right? Then people are making decisions based on something real. And if remuneration is for duration, intensity, and onerousness of uh, the work that you do that's socially valued, there's no way to get ahead, right, by trying to sell more or by trying to sell at a higher price or none of those things affect my income, right? Because my income is affected differently than that. Uh, and so it turns out that the following system, roughly with some embellishments as it gets bigger and has to take into account things like investment and so on, um, proves to have a whole lot of resilience and to, and to make sense. And the system is you don't have a central planner and you don't, have, you don't even have a center. What you have is the workers' councils and the consumers' councils. And so the workers' council, let's say we're a bicycle factory. So we have to make a proposal uh, at the start of the planning period for the number of bicycles we want to produce. And remember, what, what we want to do is produce things that are socially valued, which means they have to be, people have to want them despite their true social cost. So we're producing bicycles and we're trying to decide how many we want to propose to produce for this year. Well, the way we, we decide that is, first of all, we look at last year and now we figure out what the changes are and you know, in demographics and population and so on. And we come up with a first proposal uh, for bicycle production. But that proposal is basically also proposing I'm a bicycle worker. It's produce, It's proposing how much work I have to do, right? So when I make that proposal, I'm taking into account the implications for me or our workers' council is taking into account the implications for all of us, the implications for our work, the implications for our air conditioning and so on and so forth. So we make a proposal. People in consumer councils around the country are making a proposal for bicycles, not specific bicycles, not a certain color of bicycle, not even a certain type of bicycle, just bicycles. Why can it be just bicycles? Because statistically we can easily move from and this is something that you alluded to earlier too. Statistically, we can easily move from uh, overall desire for bicycles to refining it into its, you know, the different types. Um, uh, that's already done. So, um, so now we've got a proposal from consumers for bicycles, and we've got a proposal from a bicycle factory for producing bicycles. Well, they're not going to match. There's no reason to expect them to match right off the bat. Right. And in fact, what we should expect, since people are saying what they want, is that people want more bicycles uh, than the bicycle producers want to produce because the bicycle producers would rather produce less and have more, you know, more relaxed work, work time uh, or fewer hours for that matter. But when these things are out of whack, that's a technical term. <laughs> when these things don't match up, right? And it's supply and demand. That's what it is, right? It's a supply that's proposed and a demand that's proposed. Well, when they don't match up, you have to do something that is a trajectory toward their matching up throughout the whole economy, not just bicycles and bicycle workers, but everything. And so the system is a system of um, consumers and workers uh, uh, councils making proposals getting feedback based upon the rest of the economy and then refining their proposals and doing that through a number of rounds. They're called iterations and that is a technical term. Um, they, you, you, doing that through a number of rounds until the economy um, gets into an acceptable degree of accord. Um, now there's more to it. There, is, there are various um, um, structures, we call them facilitation boards, that do various kinds of uh, calculation based upon the, the information that's coming from consumers and the information that's coming from producers. Um, and that, that those calculations are useful to people uh, in those councils to, to make their proposals. You can make this as streamlined as you want um, by cutting away the communication of of uh, qualitative information and just relying on the prices. Or you can add a considerable amount of the qualitative information. And this is a difference between Robin and I. Um, he wants it as streamlined as possible and I want a lot of the qualitative information included. Uh, 
Um, but in any event, um, the idea is there's no center, there's no top, there's a cooperative negotiation of inputs and outputs of workplaces and and consumers. And uh, uh, the plan that emerges moves toward and arrives at something very close, nothing's ever perfect, something very close to true social costs and benefits and ecological benefits as well. And so this takes the place of uh, central planning and of markets. It's, uh, it's not authoritarian. It's not competitive. Uh, there is no um, um, zero sum game. There is no winners and losers. Uh, the interests of people actually uh, accommodate each other. Uh, and there are lots of ways to see that. I mean, we're, we're describing a whole alternative economy. And so it's hard to do it, you know, and, quickly and it's hard to do it without thinking through various other aspects of it um, like investments say or sure. the, the way in which the the cost of pollution is bound up into the prices um, uh, those are the, those are things which are in the model but I, I I don't think maybe to pursue them in this level of discussion is yeah. is ideal um, uh, let me ask how much of the, the criteria it seems, and I don't know if, you know, I don't want to ask too many questions that throw us off, but the criteria for the onerousness of the work, the impact it has on people, it would seem to me that some of that is subjective, that we're going to, sure. right. So, so then that bit gets back to the workers' councils or the consumer councils being able to sort of hash that out among themselves. But then my question yeah. is with the workers councils and the consumer councils, it would seem that workers are also consumers. Consumers are also workers. So there's two separate councils. How would they, so you'd have somebody who's working in a factory who also sits on a consumer council or somebody sure. who's working at a restaurant or whatever it may be. Yeah, whatever it is. And I, if you think about it, when I make a proposal um, for what my workplace should do, along with the rest of the workers. I'm basically saying, look, this is the amount of work that I think is average for the economy, right? Uh, and I'm also then saying, this is the size of social product that this average amount of work yields. And therefore, this is the amount of consumption that I'm saying I should get right? Because I'm going to get an average piece of that, roughly speaking. If I work a little longer, I'll get more. If I work, right? If I work a little harder, I'll get more. But roughly speaking, the average is the crucial factor here. And the same thing is true on the consumer side. As a consumer, if, if I give my whole consumption bundle, right, in the planning process, well, my consumption bundle is me saying, this is the amount of social product that I think everybody should get unless I happen to be working a, a little more or whatever, but let's say I'm average. So this is the amount of, of consumption that I think people should get. And then I'm implying what the workload should be. And you see how everything has to come in accord eventually for the whole thing to happen, uh, but it can. And uh, you know, you can show that mathematically and all sorts of kinds of stuff. But um, uh, the, 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 the understanding of, of what it is isn't that complicated. It's basically instead of central planners sort of using polls to get information, and that's what they're doing, or, or using um, uh, in, uh, reports about the clearing the shelves in workplace in, in you know consumption centers, and then deciding what the workload will be and what the output will be and all the rest of it instead of that um and then uh consumers going and buying what they choose to do i mean that's what happened in the soviet union it's not as if people didn't go to stores there were stores it's just that your income was determined by a dictate from uh, from the central plan and what was in the stores was determined by that so now instead of that being the way things are determined it's determined by a cooperative negotiation of workers and consumers councils. Uh, and it, it, again, uh, it doesn't mean that experts play no role. Of course they play a role, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, they play a role in investment inside the workplaces. They play a role in figuring out how to how to reorganize work so it's more effective and more efficient, and on and on. Um, uh, but the decisions are made in a self-managing way, and this allocation system lets you do that, even with the arguably most complicated and generalized kind of decision how much of x and y should we make because it affects everybody it, uh, do you want to any more thoughts on participatory planning allocation do you want to move on to ecology because one of the questions that's popping up in my mind as i'm listening to you is sort of the what would be the political implications of this and i'm i'm thinking this might be a question for next time so we could end with like some broader questions in other words go ahead no go ahead in other words there seems there would need to be what is the relation to this project to an an existing political project in other words concepts around sovereignty legality uh international law all of that seems to be in jeopardy and in question within this model not in jeopardy um but in that that all of that would have to be rethought out everything everything comes up yeah Uh, you know everything um is impacted because all the key dimensions of society impact each other. Right. And that's true for the economy impacting others, but also for the others impacting the economy. So, so and in fact, one of the things that you have to ask about participatory economics is, can it accommodate and even help propel and facilitate um, a vision for how people should live in their homes for kinship mm-hmm. or a vision for culture or you're asking about polity. Yeah. Um, now, some people say about polity, that's what I call it, um, instead of government, um, the political sphere of life. Some people say, well, you know, get rid of it, right? It's, um, I, I'm an anarchist and I don't want government. I don't want any authority above um, people. Yeah. Uh, some structure, a state structure, which is above us and ruling us. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want that either, but I don't think that means you have no polity. Um, That's, that's where I differ from that. And it's similar. You can, you can make an analogy to the economy. There are those who say, you know, I don't want any corporations. Corporations pollute. Corporations are killing us all. I don't want any corporations. And then they extrapolate to, I don't want any workplaces. Mm -hmm. And of course that's insane. The idea isn't to get rid of workplaces. It's to do these functions, which are important functions in this case, production, consumption, and allocation in a way that's consistent with our values. Well, the same thing arises for polity. Um, I think the functions for the, for polity that are core to it, the way those other functions are core to the economy is what it's, it's legislation, adjudication, and in some cases, execution of the will. Um, that, that seems to me to be the case. I don't think those things are going to disappear. So um, the, the task would be to figure out a participatory polity. A guy named Steve Shalom has done work on that that I think is totally consistent with participatory economics. That's not surprising because... He's an advocate of both, but um, nonetheless, you have to come up with political institutions to accomplish those functions that are consistent with and vice versa, economic vision and other kinds of visions. Right. So you're right, but I don't think it represents any kind of a problem. Um, It's true that large functions of the state, what we now call the state, disappear as soon as you have a participatory economy. So in other words, there's no there's no separate government budget. There's no necessity for that. There's no necessity for taxation. There's no necessity for the IRS. There's no necessity for um, uh, things like that. Um, you you still need some kind of adjudicative system, some kind of court system. And those people would people in there would have balanced job complexes and would be getting remunerated equitably. So that's the economy affecting that. Um, And the government could affect the economy. Maybe the government passes a law um, uh, that says 
uh, I, I don't know, um, chickens are protected. So then the economy can no longer kill chickens and eat them, right? Because the society has decided that that's just not permitted. Mm -hmm. right? So the polity could do that, and then the economy would have to abide that. And you, you know, so the, the two realms each impact the other. That was a silly example, but they each impact the other. Um, yeah, no, we should leave it because that's a, that's a topic I would like to get into more. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask you more questions about that because the concern I have is that this dovetails with sort of American libertarian ideology around withering the state down away from having collective institutions that encompass everyone. So like a state apparatus, nationalism for me um, gives us a way, and I think we're starting to see some of the problems that we have right now, which is the more fragmentation, the less centralization, the less of some kind of a unified ideology or project that we all sort of identify under. My concern is that you have what we've had uh, to some degree with some of the anarchist activism, you know, and with some of the sort of politics, the way it's unfolded here um, or the, the way in which that, that ideology would, um, you know, maybe be confusing for people who are constantly hearing from uh, say others that we should get rid of the state, that the state has sort of a very minimal function to play and that the actual, the real uh, sort of center of life is the economy. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's, it's not the case. They both are fundamentally important. I wouldn't call it the state. I would call it the polity. And uh, that might seem like nitpicking, but it, it, it avoids getting into a debate with people who, in whose head <clears throat> the state is an intrinsically oppressive apparatus. Sure. If that's the case. We don't want it. So if, if that's what they mean by the word state, throw it out. And then, and then you're left with polity and, and we can talk about that. You said you wanted to talk about it later. So yeah. we'll do that. But, um, I, I don't, I don't think the, 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 uh, the issue here is homogenization, let's call it, um, uh, leading to um, uh, workability and disaggravation, disaggregation leading to unworkability. I don't believe that. I think diversity is a big virtue. The problem is if there are opposed agendas um, which um, are exploitative of each other. Okay, so that's horrendous, right? But if you get rid of that, um, if you get rid of class division, if you're or diminishing it drastically um, and ditto for race and gender, um, there should still be a whole lot of diversity left. Humans aren't, you know, uh, a kind of animal that is uniform. We're not. Um, we have different capacities and inclinations and, and tastes and moreover, um, we focus on things and so there's lots of diversity and there'll be lots of disagreements and that's part of why you need a polity um, but there's nothing wrong with that uh, and in fact it's it's desirable um, or i think it's desirable so I, I guess we can talk about that if you want but um i think it's it's risky to extrapolate from what we have now to what we think will exist in a better society. The way to do that is to ask whether the causes of what we have now will also exist in the better society or something else which has completely different implications will exist, right? So we'll still have genes, we'll still have you know genetics, we'll still have human nature, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, but we won't have certain other things which are what produces uh, the ill effects that we talk about. It, we'll still have, you know, Hannibal Lecter will pop up every so often, you know, uh, <laughs> serial killer massacre, you know, right, right, stuff right. like that will still pop up every so often. And so we need to be prepared in a good society to deal with it and to address it, of course. Um, but, um, and, and so will debates. So maybe in a good society, there'll be disputes about abortion or there'll be disputes about um, uh, 
um, next steps uh, after participatory economics and participatory polity and all the rest of it. There will be some next step debates, and there will be and so on and so forth, and that's fine. Uh, but what there shouldn't be too much of is uh, constituencies of people with opposed interests where one gets ahead at the expense of the other, right? That's, that's a recipe for difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, diversity isn't the recipe for diff difficulty, but that is. Um, do you want to round it out by talking a little bit about ecology or do you want us to wait till next time? Does it make sense to bring it up now? It's up to you. <laughs> what do we have? Participatory planning sometimes can be very mechanical, almost, or sound very mechanical, antisocial. So what do you think of that concern? Um, yeah, let's, let's get you to answer that, actually. So some people would say that this would take a lot of, that it's very mechanical, um, that there, it would require maybe some antisocial behavior or that it would require a whole bunch of whatever it may be. What, what is your sort of response to that? Um, it can be true. So remember I said participatory economics is uh, workers and consumers, self-managing councils, equitable remuneration, balanced job complexes, and participatory planning. Well, in different countries and at different times, you implement those four core features and then you lay on top of it a whole lot of other stuff for instance what industries do you have what is it that you're producing and on and on um but you can there's also variation in how you implement the four things those four key elements and i think that variation will only be ironed out probably by practice and by learning and experience what works really well and what doesn't work so well um and there can be disagreement among advocates of the system about that. So for instance, some, some, one concern, um, how do I put this? W one concern regarding um, participatory economics is that it's too demanding of workers and consumers. It takes too much of their time. Um, now, I, I could reply to that. I won't. I don't think that's the case. I think it frees up tons of time. Um, when you actually look at everything that's eliminated, and the extra time that goes into planning. Um, but nonetheless, you could make it more or less streamlined. You could make it more or less sort of uh, simple and quick as compared to longer and more negotiated. We said it was a cooperative negotiation. Well, you could reduce the time of the negotiation and you could, re and you could try and congeal more and more into the prices and then sort of more and more mechanically handle the prices. Um, and I don't like that. I, I, I tend to not like that approach and to prefer an approach which embodies the social dimensions of economic interaction, which has workers and consumers not just dealing with prices and numbers, even if they're going to get good solutions, but also dealing with empathy to, for other people and the, therefore understanding. Uh, more about the circumstances of other people um, and uh, hearing about it and negotiating about it. Now, not endlessly, not, you know, but productively uh, to arrive at a plan. And so my reaction to that is that um, it can exist. It's also possible for the presentation of it to give a false image of more of that than exists. And that this comes in lots of domains. If if your if your opposition is saying something, so if, let's say the opposition to participatory economics is saying, stop saying it won't be productive enough because balanced job complexes won't, you know, the ninety percent, the eighty percent can't do enough. So it's let's say the opposition stops saying that. And the opposition stops saying equitable remuneration is no good because people won't have the incentive of trying to become rich to work hard. We didn't talk about that. Maybe we should have. It's total nonsense. Um, uh, and, but what they continue to say, let's say, is it's crazy. It's, um, as one person called it, nonsense on stilts. There's too much information. There's too much 
requirement of, uh, of people to be engaged in negotiation, to pay attention to economic phenomena, um, which they don't really want to do. They want to enjoy their this, that, or the other thing. And the response to that can be to try and um, diminish that by making the description of participatory planning more and more mathematical, more and more cut and dried. So it becomes less and less time consuming and almost automatic. Um, and, you know, I, uh, this is a bit of a dispute between Robin and I in, in how we present it. Uh, it's not so much in what the underlying values are or what the logic is or anything like that. It's mostly about how it's presented, maybe a little bit more than that. Mm -hmm. um, but you see what I'm saying. So this is an issue. Um, and it's, it's too bad to the extent that it, that it gives that impression. But again, it, it, it's, you, you can't judge things without saying not only what new demands does it make, but what demands does it resume, re remove, right? So if we're going to talk about how much time we have to spend in our economic lives, so to speak, then, then we'll, what we should talk about is in a participatory economy, you're not producing garbage anymore. You're not producing waste. You're not producing, you know, advertising and all of that. You're not producing weapons and, and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And so you're getting rid of a significant portion of the waste of human potentials and you're reducing the work week dramatically. And, um, you know, you no longer have to hassle with the IRS and you no longer have to hassle with your boss because you don't have one and you no longer have to hassle with um, the, the constraints on you and you're no longer worried about food and all the rest of it. And yeah, you do spend some more time in planning because before you didn't do anything. Um, under capitalism, you have absolutely no say. You, you, you know, you, don't know, you have no impact on any of that. Um, does your neighborhood impact the collective consumption decisions, does it affect, does it impact, only by movements, right? Mm -hmm. Not via the economy. The, right. Via the economic institutions, nobody has any impact on pollution, on anything, except those at the top who make a mess. Um, so, yes, more time goes into all that stuff, um, but way less time than we win from the other changes. And the, and time going into that stuff is no longer a negative. It's people taking care of their lives. It's people interacting with society and with the world and with each other. That's not a negative. That's the opposite of alienation. Yeah. Uh, it's just that people don't really get that right now. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.